Clark tells us you're on your own this year. We don't allow anyone to visit for the holidays without taking a present home with them. But I brought no gift for you. Nonsense. Your company is the only present we need. Hey, hello, how do you do? Shady Do Rags here. Merry Christmas, everyone. Since it's the season of giving, I'm going to give you intellectuals a special treat. Why did I stress that word? That wasn't a pun. Who writes these freaking scripts? Don't think your response to the Teen Titans video didn't go unnoticed. It's been a hot minute since something matched King of the Hill in views, let alone beat it. This tells me exactly what I need to know. You guys want more superhero shows. Actually, we specifically want more Teen Titans. Yes, more superhero shows. Your cries have been heard loud and clear. Today, we're looking at Comfort and Joy, the Christmas episode of what I consider to be the absolute best superhero cartoon ever made, Justice League, the animated series. To be clear, I consider Justice League and Justice League Unlimited to be the same show, so I'm not arguing one is better than the other. What I am arguing is that both of them are better than everything else. Yeah, that's a fact. Now, technically, I have talked about this show on the channel before, but that was way back before I even had my first 100 subscribers, so I highly doubt any of you even know those videos exist. Thus, I'm going to give the needed context as if none of you have ever heard of this show. Justice League, based on the comic book series of the same name, is a continuation of Batman the Animated Series and Superman the Animated Series. After realizing they could do more good together than separate, a group of superheroes form a team to unite their abilities against threats too big for any one of them individually we would be a force that could truly work for the ideals of peace and justice. What, like a bunch of super friends? More like a Justice League. The team featured seven members. Superman, an alien powered by solar radiation raised with human principles. Batman, a detective trained in martial arts with access to private technology. Wonder Woman, an Amazonian princess powered by the Greek god's magic. Green Lantern, an intergalactic police officer who can create constructs. The Flash, the fastest man alive. Martian Manhunter, a shape-shifting telepathic Martian. And Hot Girl, a bird humanoid from another planet where war is basically a daily occurrence. Ooh, talk about diversity. We got your woman. We got your person of color. We got your illegal aliens. Wait, do literal aliens count? FYI, the heroes' real names respectively are Clark Kent, Bruce Wayne, Diana Prince, Jon Stewart, Wally West, Jon Jones, and Shira Hall. I'm letting you know this now because unlike Teen Titans where the characters went by their hero names exclusively and ignored their civilian names 99% of the time, Justice League jumps back and forth, and so will I in this review. Jean is the exception. The show only calls him Jean because Martian Manhunter is the biggest mouthful in the universe. If you read comics, you might think this is a slightly unorthodox Collection of characters. No Hal Jordan, no Barry Allen, and Hawk Girl of all people? Hawk Girl? What's she doing here? Well, remember what I said about Teen Titans. One of the most important aspects of a superhero teen show is watching their personalities clash. Hal and Barry would have been more faithful to the comics, but John and Wally's personalities make for a more interesting dynamic. Also, this is a continuation, so I'm a little uncertain of how many characters already existed in Batman and Superman. Flash certainly did, but I don't think he was revealed to be Wally at the time. Still, with his constant joking nature, he kind of had to be. Sorry I'm late. Just woke up two minutes ago. All right, that's all you need to know. Let us proceed. The episode starts with Justice League doing what they do. Two planets are on a collision course with each other and the natives of one planet have asked for help to prevent it. You gave us the knowledge to construct the gravitation device and trusted the League to be your hands. We will not fail you. Status report flash. Just keep beaming those instructions into my head, John. It's a lot of exposition you got going on there. The League finished their machine, which stabilizes the ice planet's orbit, and you'll probably notice immediately that two members are missing. Well, with a show that has seven main characters, you need to know when to sideline some. While it's fun to have everyone there, constantly trying to force them into situations they don't belong in would be bothersome. Also, it makes sense lore-wise, as superheroes each would be too busy to respond to every Justice League call. This time around, the ones who drew the short straw were Diana and Bruce, so this Christmas will be without Wonder Woman and Bat. This Christmas will be without Batman. As the League gets ready to head out, Flash and Superman express their eagerness to celebrate Christmas. Jean, being an alien who only recently made Earth his home, doesn't really have any Christmas spirit. Superman, being Superman, decides that that's not the American way and proceeds to scheme. Meanwhile, Green Lantern decides to stay on the ice planet for mysterious reasons and Shira indulges him. And then we get the intro. Now, it is a bit cheesy, but talk about hype. The music and cinematography really make you feel like you're about to see legends in action. As a kid, this 
always got me excited for the show. I even made up lyrics to sing along with the theme. Admittedly, the animation does have a bit of an Uncanny Valley feel to it in some parts, but that's easily forgivable. What really sells it are the silhouettes. When you can't fully see the detail of something, it gives an aura mystique that perfectly fits this intro. Anyway, the episode continues and we see Jon snowboarding down a hill. You fly through space all the time, but sliding down a snowy hill makes you shriek like a child? Shira, it's not necessarily that it's exciting now, it's just that it reminds him of a time when his life was full of excitement. <sighs> I love nostalgia. Each winter, my grandmother would take me sledding in the park. It was the best part of Christmas. Excuse me for a second. Holy crap, it's Phil Lamar! Okay, I'm back. Yep, that's our boy Phil Lamar voicing Green Lantern. If you don't recognize how he sounds here, his voice might sound familiar when he's trying to get back to the past, or when he's putting a shock to your system, or when he's living for the weekend. John continues to demonstrate to Shiera what exactly makes the snow so enjoyable to him, going through all the Christmas cliches. It's a snow angel. See my wings? Right. Give whoever wrote that joke a medal. Eventually, John is able to find an activity Shira can get into. She's from a war planet after all, so fighting is natural to her. Bring it on, snowman! Ha, I get it. The episode transitions back to Earth, where we see the Flash visiting some orphans. Merry Christmas, guys. Have you been good this year? For those of you who don't know, both within the show and in the comics, The Flash is loved by Central City more than any other superhero is from their hometown. The reason for this is because rather than acting like a god who looks down on the people, like most DC heroes, Flash acts like a good neighbor who just happens to have superpowers. He'll ask you how your day is going and will stop to help you with the most mundane of problems. The people of Central City feel like The Flash is their friend. Now, Superman does this too, but it's slightly different for reasons we'll get into later. I said this in the Teen Titans video and I'll say it here. Good gravy do I miss when superheroes were simply good people. Getting back, every year The Flash promises to get the orphans one Christmas present of their choice. This year, the kids want a DJ Rubba Ducky. I want to be upset, but I've seen so many poop and fart based toys, I can't even call this unrealistic. The orphan's caretaker warns Flash that the stores have been sold out for weeks, but Flash ensures he's got this in the bag. We then transition to the last story. Superman invites Jean to stay at his parents' farm to celebrate Christmas. Clark. Hi, Ma. Pa. Merry Christmas. Huh. <sighs> it's the Kents. Clark was most insistent I join you for the holiday. Oh, we're no strangers to aliens in this house. You just make yourself at home. Before Nolan and Snyder got their grubby little hands on them, Jonathan and Martha Kent were the most wholesome characters in all of comic books. They were warm, loving, and cared about people on a small level. They are Superman's anchor to his sense of right and wrong, and it makes sense that as simple farm folk, they are what helped define him. I've never seen this side of you, Clark. That's why I like coming home for the holidays. I can just relax and be myself. This is what I meant when I said Superman had a slight difference to the Flash. Clark Kent is also one of the nicest guys on the planet, but he plays the secret identity game very close to the chest, and thus can only be nice in certain ways as Superman and nice in other ways as Clark. It's only when he's in a place where he doesn't have to worry about all that, like his parents' farm, can he let it all out and just be himself. All right, now that we've gotten all three stories introduced, I'll stop jumping around and go through them one by one. Shire and John continue their snowball war, but take it to the next level. I absolutely love the concept of superheroes using their superpowers to just mess around and have fun. When you have an ability for a long enough time, it just becomes a part of you. Eventually, John overwhelms Shira and is declared the victor. Feeling more festive? I still don't get this whole obsession with the holidays. Back on Thanagar, we would celebrate after a successful battle. I have found one planet where the people celebrated the same way. Oh yeah? You wouldn't like it. I have a day off and a fully charged power ring. Try me. So Hawk Girl and Green Lantern head to a strange part of space and uh... Excuse me, that's clearly a Thanagarian. John, are you not seeing this? Shire is supposed to be lost from her home race, but a Thanagarian just walked by like it was nothing. You might want to ask her some questions. You said this is where you go to relax? No, I said this is where I go to celebrate. Not the question I meant, John. <sighs> it's fine. You'll find out the truth in literally the next episode. So John experiences Shire's place of choice and finds it to be more exotic than he was expecting. <laughs> Um, actually, a Green Lantern's ring automatically translates any language directed at him that he doesn't understand. Try this. It's great. Get it? Because she's part bird? Since Shire was having so much fun with a snowball fight, naturally the night could only be made better 
with a real fight. Not gonna lie, while it does fit Shire's character to randomly start a fight, part of me thinks this was put here to help meet the action quota. A lot of superhero shows will find random reasons to add a fight scene because, you know, that's what most people are here for. At the end of it all, Shira, John, and their new best friend snuggle up for a good night's rest. Merry Christmas, John. Oh yeah, did I neglect to mention that these two were an item at this point? Yeah, in case you didn't catch on, this whole debacle was supposed to be a superhero Christmas date. John shares some of his customs and Shira shares some of hers. While I can appreciate the sentiment of it all, I think it would have hit home better if there was just one moment where John was on the alien moon and was actually having fun. The entire time, he just looks uncomfortable and or frustrated. I would have liked it more if he had gotten into the bar fight just like Shira got into the snowball fight. Anyway, back to the Flash's story. Wally attempts to fulfill his promise to get the kids their DJ Rubber Ducky. He finds out the hard way though that the caretaker wasn't kidding when she said they were sold out everywhere. Being the fastest man alive, Wally figures he'll go straight to the source and is able to get his hands on the very last one made from the Japanese factory itself. Something tells me that a superhero getting a toy from an Asian factory would not go over well in today's age. As the Flash heads back to the orphanage, he hears an explosion and being a superhero, he prioritizes. Do you believe the horrendous amount of public funding spent on this so-called art? It's garbage, an affront to any decent human aesthetic. Wait, Flash, hold on, let him finish what he's doing. This is Ultra Humanite, by the way. You don't need to know much about him except that he's a super genius, a reoccurring supervillain, and his whole shtick is acting superior. The Flash manages to beat Humanite, of course, but in doing so, his DJ Rubber Ducky gets destroyed. Wally laments out loud that the toy was for some kid's Christmas. Humanite scoffs and gives a lecture of how he hates Christmas because all the supposed good that comes out of it is manufactured. Forced jollity on every lip, insincere goodwill in every heart, tidings of comfort and joy indeed. Flash, however, explains that Humanite is missing the point. For a creep that claims to personify human advancement, I think you'd know what it means to pass along goodwill, especially to kids who need some. I'd like to think they'd grow up to pass that goodwill on to others. <sighs> it never ceases to amaze me how well this show made sure the comic relief character was the heart of the team. Humanite admits that while Flash's sentiments are childish, there is some value to be found in them. He calls a truce with Wally for the sake of the children, and not only fixes the toy, but gives it an upgrade. Hello, children. Come close and I'll tell you a story. Is that DJ Rubber Ducky? Well, an improvement, wouldn't you say? I kind of liked it when he made the poopy noise. Her beloved toy came alive to lead her but on this a is good too. adventure. Before heading out, the Flash decides to pay Humanite a visit and say thanks. An aluminum Christmas tree. I know, it's kind of cheesy, but... No, no, we had one just like it when I was... It's very nice. This freaking show, my goodness gracious. Ah, I've got tears in my eyes. Oh wait, the meme. Um, Time to throw steaks on the grill. Nah, screw the meme. Guys, I cry every time. Honestly, The Flash's story is my favorite of the trio. I just love seeing how he's able to give even Humanite some minor joy in his life. All right. Let's finish this up. Back at the farm, the Kents are sharing stories of Christmas past with Jean. We used to wrap his presents in lead foil so he couldn't peek. You mean Santa wrapped them? Oh, of course, dear. Okay, so one of the things this episode wants to do is show that Superman behaves differently when he's at home because he's being his true self. It does this by making Clark super naive. Objectively, it doesn't really make any sense. Superman, whose fortress of solitude is in the North Pole, still believes in Santa Claus. Yeah, that is a ludicrous thing to ask your audience to accept. Subjectively, however, I don't care. And everyone I know who has seen this episode doesn't care either. It is funny and charming that Superman, the most powerful being on Earth, is so innocent he still thinks Santa is a thing. This is a perfect example of writers doing something objectively bad, but doing so makes the experience better. This is why art isn't an exact science. Anyway, the kids have a gift for Jean. Our group at the community center always knits a few extra gifts. I wasn't sure about the size. I can grow into it. If we could somehow harness the wholesomeness of this scene, we could generate enough power for world domination! And then we won't go through with it because it's Christmas. To further understand the Christmas spirit, Jean decides to take a stroll through Smallville. He sees people enjoying each other's company, reinforces a child's belief in Santa, and listens to a choir singing.
The next day, which I presume is Christmas, the Kents wake up to a surprise. Jean, in his natural form, is holding the family cat and singing. It's unclear if he did this because of the song he heard. After all, it does talk about angels singing. But what is clear is this. Jean now gets the spirit of Christmas and is expressing his joy. Because they are the nicest people in existence, the Kent seeing Jean happy is greater than any present he could have given them. And he said he didn't bring a gift. There's a lot to love about this story, but there are two things I want to draw attention to specifically. For one, other than insisting Jean stay with him on the farm, Clark never forces anything onto Jean. A lot of stories would have had Clark constantly making Jean do things with Jean protesting, but this story decides that the best way to get Jean into Christmas is to just show it to him and let him decide whether he likes it or not. The other thing is, it's never overtly said what Jean discovers. Maybe the writers felt they didn't need to do that because they already said what Christmas was about in the flash section of the story, but still, I enjoy that there's no dialogue about it in this one. You know Jean now gets Christmas in that he enjoys it, even if he never says exactly what it is he gets. And that was Justice League's comfort and joy. Good gravy, do I absolutely love this episode. Admittedly, the Hot Girl Green Lantern part could have been slightly better, but the other two stories absolutely knock it out of the park for me. All three are exactly what I want to see during Christmas. A Christmas date, a Christmas truce, and a Christmas welcoming. It's all people just enjoying each other's company and being kind to one another. Like I said before, The Flash's adventure is definitely my favorite. Watching Humanite receive simple joy breaks me every time. Also, Humanite's point about Christmas being manufactured and therefore pointless is what I see quite often. A lot of people tell me the same thing when it comes to fictional characters. They're not real, so there's no point in getting so invested in them. I actually did a video on this subject some years ago. The TLDR of the video is that while yes, fictional characters aren't real, they tend to represent something that is. The same can be said about Christmas. Just like superheroes, Christmas is a reminder of the potential good man has to offer, and it inspires people to be better versions of themselves. Also, there's the whole Jesus thing. What? I'm a Christian. I'm obligated to mention it. This has been Shady Do Rags. So long. Farewell. I'd be to say goodbye.